We are still in samsara, nirvana, and Buddha nature. <laughs> yeah. And we're in a different chapter this time. That We're in the chapter called Freedom from Cyclic Existence. And where we stopped last time was on the section on nirvana, page 262, for people who are following along. So before we start the teaching, let's uh, visualize the merit field and us surrounded by all the living beings in human form. Sorry, animals. (laughs) And think that we will uh, lead all the other living beings in taking refuge and in generating bodhicitta. Let's cultivate our motivation and rather than think in terms of me and others, look into everybody's heart and you see basically the same thing, people wanting to be happy, not wanting to suffer wanting to belong, to be supported, to be cared for. So we're all like that. So it makes sense that we all help each other and approach each other as other living beings who are exactly the same as we are inside, despite external differences or even different things that we like or different kind of food that we eat or food that we like or whatever, that those kind of differences are not very important. And especially uh, since samsara is grueling, the more we pay attention to those differences and wall ourselves off because we feel different, then the more we actually create misery, not only for ourselves, but then when we shut down, we're not giving the same kind of support and care that other living beings need. So seeing our similarities, let's really help each other instead of wall, oh, build walls around. And if you think of a big gathering of bodhisattvas, like you read about in the Mahayana scriptures, They all come for a teaching, thousands of them, millions of them. And none of those bodhisattvas think, oh, I don't belong. I've got to protect myself and I'm not going to care for other bodhisattvas. No, they come together, they enjoy the teachings, They help each other, they help other living beings. And that kind of harmony is very precious and very conducive for Dharma practice. So 
So keeping that in mind, let's cultivate love and compassion for all living beings. And then as that love and compassion grow, let it give rise to the wish to liberate living beings. And to do that, knowing that we have to attain Buddhahood first, then let's joyfully practice the path. So often when we read the news, we hear about conflict and we hear about how people feel different and uh, from others and how people, um, not only do they feel different, but then because they're hurting inside, uh, push others away and make them different. So this is all quite familiar. We've lived in this kind of world for a long time. Uh, But it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere good. It just kind of drives us all crazy. So uh, now that we have a chance to hear the teachings, it's really good to to, um, change our own self. Yeah. And, and also reach out to others in kindness. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because all that is necessary as we practice the path. Because if all you're surrounded with is fighting and quarreling, yeah, if you're a very advanced practitioner, that becomes food for your practice. But if you're an initial practitioner, it completely bogs you down. Okay. So we're going to talk about nirvana now. So everybody goes, nirvana, nirvana, that's the end. I want nirvana. How can I get nirvana? Ah, Give it to me, quick, quick. And it's not exactly like that. And the description of nirvana... Uh, you know, you're going to have to really think about about it, okay? Because we think of, we often think as Westerners, nirvana equals heaven. Yeah, but when you hear the idea of Christian heaven, I don't know about you, but it never interested me very much. It seemed like it would be quite boring, actually. So all Buddhists seek nirvana. But what is it? Okay, in general, nirvana is a state or a quality of mind. It is not an external place, nor is it something reserved for a select few. Nirvana is attainable by each and every sentient being. Okay, so there's no levels of, well, sorry, you don't belong to our group. You can't attain nirvana. Okay, you're the wrong this, you're the wrong that, so, um, you know, just be quiet and go away. No, everybody can attain nirvana. Everybody can attain full awakening. So nirvana is the ultimate nature of our minds, the emptiness of the mind that has been totally cleansed of obscurations. Okay, remember that. The emptiness of the mind that has been totally cleansed of obscurations. Yeah, so you have the mind. The emptiness of the mind is the ultimate nature of that mind. But that mind isn't just any old mind. It's the mind that has been cleansed, that no longer has the afflictive obscurations. Okay? 
Wisdom directly realizes the emptiness of all phenomena, including the emptiness of the mind itself. This wisdom gradually purifies the mind of defilements. As it does so, the emptiness of that mind, which is one nature with that mind, is also purified. The purified state of the emptiness of the mind that is free from afflictive obscurations is an arhat's nirvana. The purified state of the emptiness of the mind that is free from both afflictive and cognitive obscurations is the non-abiding nirvana of a Buddha. Okay, now somebody's going to say, well, uh, yeah, okay, but uh, isn't emptiness naturally pure? How come emptiness needs to be purified? Yeah, you're saying the purified ap- aspect of the emptiness of the mind. But emptiness was never contaminated to start with. So how come? What's going on here? Okay, this this was my question, and I asked it quite directly to His Holiness, I think more than once, because I had trouble understanding the answer. So... Uh, Let's, I'll just describe it and then we'll read too. Okay, so you have the mind, yeah, the, and the, so the, the mind is the base, yeah, and the emptiness is the attribute, the quality of that mind. And the mind and its emptiness are one nature, meaning that, uh, at, if one is there, the other's got to be there. So you can't have a mind that is not empty <laughs> because that would be a mind that is truly existent and no such thing exists. And you can't have emptiness without it being the emptiness of some object because emptiness is not some kind of external absolute out there Okay, that's just sitting out there, some permanent absolute that we don't understand. Okay, but emptiness is a quality of every single phenomena. Okay, that's, it's a, we have the table, we have the emptiness of the table, and the thermos and the emptiness of the thermos. Okay, so there's all objects have have their ultimate nature is emptiness. So our mind also, you have the mind and the emptiness of the mind, and that emptiness and the, and the mind itself are one nature, okay? So one nature, like I said, it means if one is there, then at least at some point the other one is also there, yeah? And they can't be separated but those two things are not exactly the same either, okay? Because the mind or the table or, you know, the microphone, those are impermanent phenomena. Emptiness is permanent, okay? It's a non-affirming negative. It's the absence of all the false ways of existence, okay? When the mind is covered by the afflictions, you know, and the two obscurations. The emptiness of the mind is one nature with that mind, so it is also said to be covered by those obscurations. Okay? Emptiness itself is pure. That's called natural nirvana. But when we talk about emptiness as as a quality of a mind that has afflictions or a mind that has defilements, then we say that that emptiness also is polluted in that sense because it's related to a polluted mind. But, yeah, the those pollutants don't enter the nature of the emptiness and, the, and they aren't the nature of the mind either. Okay. 
So all produced things naturally cease because a momentary disintegration is part of their nature. So anything that is produced by causes and conditions naturally ceases. You don't need some external factor to make it change because moment by moment things are changing. We don't see all the momentary change, but things are changing. And if you remember even third grade science, yeah, remember in the old days, I don't know how they teach it now, but there used to be the nucleus of the atom, and then you had these electrons buzzing around, and the nucleus had protons and neurons, and the electrons were buzzing, okay? So um, is, is that still the basic theory? Maybe in third grade. Yeah, in third grade. Yeah, we're talking third grade, okay? Because that, that's something we can all understand. Yeah, we're, we're not talking your level. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... So even the scientists tell us that atom is not remaining the same. Yeah, the electrons are changing, the protons are changing, the neutrons are changing. You know, things may not, don't have to necessarily move around and change places in order to change. I mean, you can sit here on your meditation cushion and you don't move, but you're changing. Okay, every single moment. And there, you don't need any external cause to cause that change because anything that is produced by a cause, because a cause itself doesn't remain the same, then the result of that cause is never going to remain the same either. Okay? So all produced things naturally cease because momentary disintegration is part of their nature. Their cessation does not depend on some other cause or condition that is a counterforce. Okay, so, yeah. However, the true cessation, that is the severance of afflictions, does not occur in that way. So, however, the true cessation, that is, the severance of afflictions, does not occur in that way. It is not the natural disintegration of a thing when its causal energy ceases. Okay. True cessations, remember this is the third of the four truths of the Aryas, and it's also part of the Dharma Jewel refuge. True cessations come into existence due to wisdom. And yeah, and wisdom is a counterforce that has been deliberately cultivated. So it's not some kind of natural, uh, you know, passing away, natural disintegration. But uh, the wisdom is a counterforce that has to be conscientiously um, cultivated. Yeah. And true cessations come into existence due to wisdom. We don't say true cessations arise or true cessations are produced by wisdom because that's the language you use for something that comes into existence due to a cause. You know, the flowers arise from the seed. Yeah, the cake arises from the mixture of the, the ingredients. Okay, so all those things are products, they're permanent phenomena, yeah, that arise due to causes. Okay, but uh, we don't say true cessation arises from causes, but it didn't exist before. We don't have true cessation right now, but after... Each time we eliminate a certain uh, portion of the afflictions, a true cessation comes into being. So you use the language comes into being, meaning it comes into being, it wasn't there before, but it wasn't produced by causes and conditions. Okay, so 
then how does how does it come into being if it wasn't there and then it comes into being okay so it it comes into being due to wisdom the a counter force that has been deliberately cultivated okay now here's how that works wisdom destroys ignorance such that it can never arise never <clears throat> arise again it severs the continuity of ignorance completely Okay, so uh, you know some things they their gross form ceases, but there's some continuum of them. You know the the trees fall down, but they get you know composted and they you know turn back into dirt, and then that turns into something else, and so on. Okay, but when wisdom destroys ignorance. There's no way for ignorance to come back into the mind, because ignorance and its seeds have been uh, eradicated by that by that wisdom. Okay. <clears throat> now, how does wisdom eradicate ignorance? Ignorance grasps everything to exist inherently. Yeah, that's how it. Um, Things appear to it, that's how it apprehends things. They are inherently existent. Wisdom, the particular wisdom we're talking about, apprehends phenomena in the exact opposite way than uh, ignorance does. Ignorance apprehends them as empty of inherent existence. Okay, so you have two minds. One's perceiving inherent existence, the other one's perceiving the total absence of inherent existence. So, which one's going to win? Okay. Well, which one is the correct way of apprehending things as they actually exist? <laughs> yeah. Ignorance apprehends things as truly existent. Are they truly existent? Do they exist in that way? Yeah. And we say no, but how do we know that things are not truly existent? Okay. How do we know? It's wisdom that knows. Before we have the direct, per, per, the wisdom that directly perceives emptiness, we have an inferential realization of emptiness. So this is uh, a realization of emptiness that comes about through reasoning yeah and that uh, and that came from a correct assumption which came from doubt and and so on okay so ignorance is able able to eradicate i mean wisdom is able to eradicate ignorance because what ignorance Grass does not exist, yeah, and we can determine that through logic and reasoning, yeah? as well as through direct perception, yeah. But if one person has direct perception and the other one doesn't, you're not you're not going to convince that person. You have to give them some something to you know to think about in order to see. Uh, at least inferentially, intellectually, not intellectually, it's more than an intellectual knowledge, but uh, conceptually that, that things don't inherently exist. Okay? So that's why, that's how the wisdom can overpower the ignorance. But ignorance cannot overpower wisdom. Okay? They're opposites. Yeah? But all, it, the overpowering only goes in one direction because ignorance is a wrong consciousness. So there's no way it can overpower a consciousness that is a correct consciousness. Okay? With me? Okay. So ignorance destroys, uh, wisdom destroys ignorance such that it can never arise again. It severs the continuity of ignorance completely. 
by meditating on the reasonings that refute inherent existence and establish the lack of inherent existence, we generate the Arya path. Okay, what's the Arya path? What the primary uh, sign of it is the wisdom, or what is it? It's the wisdom that directly realizes emptiness. Okay, so through reasoning, then getting the inferential realization, meditating on that, you know, single-pointedly in such a way that then the conceptual appearance uh, that is the filter that you see emptiness through fades away, and then you can perceive emptiness directly. Okay, so this wisdom apprehends the opposite of ignorance, whereas ignorance apprehends phenomena as inherently existent, wisdom apprehends them as empty of inherent existence. So this is also a reasoning that uh, proves that everybody can attain uh, full awakening. Yeah, because it proves that, you know, it. well, you have to go back and show how ignorance is the uh, foundational cause of samsara. Yeah, and if wisdom can remove that ignorance, yeah, mm -hmm. then if uh, whoever can generate that kind of wisdom can remove the ignorance, which is the fundamental cause of samsara. It's the first of the 12 links. And if you eliminate the first of the 12 links, all the other ones fall down like dominoes. Okay. So in this way, wisdom uproots ignorance and its seeds. Yeah. If the wisdom only uprooted ignorance and the seeds of ignorance stay, then the seeds could grow into manifest ignorance. Okay. That's why when we pull up the napweed, we try and pull it up by the root, and we try and pull it up before the flowers go to seed, because once they've gone to seed, then we have, what did you say, 25,000 seeds in one plant or in one, yeah. And then that's, that's difficult, yeah. Okay. So in this way, ignorance uproots, uh, keep saying that for this way, wisdom uproots ignorance and its seeds. By the cessation and non-arising of ignorance, okay, so the term non-arising sometimes refers to emptiness, sometimes refers to, uh, yeah, just the cutting of the continuum of something. Okay. By the cessation and non-arising of ignorance, all other afflictions cease as well, because ignorance is like the root, and all the other afflictions are like the branches that come off of it. Okay, you cut the... Yeah, we just were watching that all last two weeks. You uproot the tree and all the branches come crashing down too. Okay, so then formative action, the second link, uh, they cease, as do all the other remaining links. Okay, so there's a debate whether nirvana is a non-affirming negative. In other words, a simple negation that doesn't apply, imply anything or if it's an affirming negative, a statement that negates one thing while implying another thing. Okay. An example of the former is the I is empty. So here you're just making a statement of negation. The I is empty. Okay. You're not establishing anything. You're just negating the inherent existence of the I. Yeah. Uh, an example would be, uh, what's an example? Mm. Yeah, the fridge is empty. <laughs> there, your fridge 
You're, the emptiness isn't of inherent existence, it's of food. But you're just negating the existence of food. You're not implying the existence of something else. Okay? So that's a non-affirming negative. An example of the latter, which is an affirming, affirming negative, here you say, the I, that is empty. Okay, so the wording is different and it gives you a different feeling. When you're saying the I that is empty, yeah, you're asserting the I and then you're negating the inherent existence. Okay, which is different than just saying the I is empty, which is negating inherent existence. The I that is empty, there's an I, it is empty. So you're affirming the I, negating an inherent existence. Okay, so that's an example. Um, the I that is empty serves, uh, asserts a positive phenomena, the I, while negating that it's, it's being inherently existent. Okay, and the reason this is important is because there's a lot of debate between different traditions about what nirvana is, okay? And are we trying to realize something that is just uh, this simple negation? Yeah, phenomena are not, you know, are not inherently existent. Or um, are we trying to assert something in there? You know, and so you do get a difference between the different Buddhist traditions. Sankhapa is very clear the ultimate nature is a non affirming negative. It's just emptiness. Basta finito. Okay? That doesn't mean emptiness is some absolute existing in some other universe, like some kind of positive phenomena. Okay, so emptiness is not like a, a cosmic um, fundamental material. Yeah, we talk about things arising within emptiness. Yeah, meaning that emptiness is just the nature of things, and so things, of course, have to arise within their own nature. But emptiness is not something out there as a positive phenomena that, you know, we were, because positive phenomena, I mean, this positive phenomena, you, you can gr grasp it. Yeah. You can say, yeah, you can, you can grasp it. It's something you can say here is fortitude fox. Okay. Yeah. But when you just talk emptiness, yeah, oh, you know, we always like everything to have some color or shape or form or sound. We like it to have something that it is, yeah. But that, if emptiness were like that, like some, like some spiritual traditions say there's a cosmic substance and everything arises out of that cosmic substance, okay. So they might even say, well, the cosmic substance, you can't see it or hear it, but it's still some positive phenomena out there out of which everything arises. Yeah. Uh, you know, Sankhapa says, uh-uh, it's just the very nature of things. It's not some positive phenomena that you can circumscribe and, you know, draw a circle around and say, here it is, and this is emptiness, and, you know, I'll show it to you here. Okay. Some traditions, especially when they talk about Tantra, and this doesn't mean that they're contradictory, but some traditions will emphasize the mind that is empty as the ultimate truth. Okay. And that makes it an affirming negation because the mind is a positive phenomena. Okay, so there's a lot of debate about this kind of thing. Yeah. 
But I think if you really understand it well, you can see that both both viewpoints have have uh, make some sense. Okay, so some people say that nirvana is an emptiness, the lack of inherent existence, that uh, the lack of inherent existence that has never existed. Okay, so ne- inherent existence has never, ever, ever existed. So the emptiness that is the absence of inherent existence has always been there, okay? It is not something that is newly created like hiccups. (laughs) Yeah, that was not there and that come right in the middle of, you know, giving a talk, okay? (laughs) So... Some people say nirvana is an emptiness, the lack of inherent existence that never existed. Emptiness always existed. In, you know, the inherent existence never existed. So it's lack of it always did. So this is a non-affirming negative, a permanent phenomena, and an ultimate truth. Others say nirvana is the extinguishment of the afflictions, and the afflictions are something which did exist. Okay, so you hear this often, um, and, and the word nirvana, you know, in the Tibetan tradition is used in in both ways, and in the Pali tradition as well. Yeah, so uh, nirvana is also said to be the extinguishment of ignorance, anger, and attachment. It's the extinguishment of the grasping, okay? So the grasping or the ignorance, anger, and attachment are existent phenomena. And when those are removed, okay, then that's their extinguishment. Okay, so it's different than saying emptiness, yeah, in which you never, you did not newly extinguish anything. Emptiness has always been there because the uh, inherent existence has never been there. Yeah, but here the ones who say that uh, that emptiness is an affirming negative, you had the afflictions and now you are. It's the absence of the afflictions, the true cessation of the afflictions, or the extinguishment of the afflictions. And the afflictions were existent phenomena. Okay, so they say it is an ultimate truth, but not an emptiness. Okay, so this is Penchen Sonam Drakpa. Yeah, and so even within the Tibetans, there's a, a, a big debate about it. So His Holiness says, here's how I see it. And he quotes uh, Nagarjuna's Precious Garland. Yeah, where Nagarjuna says, Nirvana is said to be the cessation of the notions of things and non-things. Nirvana is said to be the cessation of the notions of things and non-things. Okay, so let me explain. When we talk about the object of negation, there's two objects of negation, okay? One existed, one didn't, okay? There's the object of negation of the path, which is ignorance. Yeah, that's what you're trying to remove. Yeah, and how do you remove it? By the path wisdom, the wisdom realizing emptiness, okay? Then you have the object of negation of reasoning, and that's inherent existence or true existence, yeah? And that is negated by using reasoning. In other words, you don't realize emptiness by sitting down and emptying your mind of all thoughts or by sitting down and saying, empty, 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 empty. (laughs) You know, that's not how you realize it. You have to disprove it to yourself. Okay? So that's the object of negation of reasoning. And 
that object of negation, inherent existence, never has existed. The grasping at inherent existence does exist. It's the object of negation of the path because when you practice the path, you are cutting away yeah, that, that ignorance, that grasping. And so that grasping did exist. The inherent existence didn't. So you have the object of negation of the path, the object of negation of reasoning. Yeah. Usually when we say object of negation, we mean the one of reasoning. Yeah. Okay. So nirvana is, is uh, said to be the cessation of the notion of things and non-things. But above, you know, he was quoting others say, nirvana is the extinguishment or extinction of the afflictions, which did exist. Okay, so going back to that phrase, nirvana is the extinction of afflictions. What does that mean? Okay. It means not only that afflictions, which are things, so it matches that quotation above, or above, okay, not only that afflictions, which are things, have been extinguished, but also there are no inherently existent afflictions or non-things in nirvana. So in nirvana, there's no afflictions, yeah, they've been cut from the root. But there's no inherently existent afflictions, and there never have been any inherently existent uh, afflictions. So those are called non-things. The term non-things you find in different scriptures, and it has a lot of very, very different meanings. And Every time you read it in a quotation, you have to figure out what the term non-things means. Okay, I might have put a few of the definitions in here. Let's see. Mm, no, I didn't. Okay. Okay. So, uh, nirvana is the extinction of afflictions, means not only that afflictions, things, have been extinguished, but also that there are no inherently existent afflictions, non-things, in nirvana, or anywhere else for that matter. Okay? So this beginningless absence of inherently existent afflictions is emptiness an ultimate truth? Okay, the beginningless absence of inherently existent afflictions. So afflictions have existed beginninglessly, but inherently existent afflictions never have existed. So the beginningless absence of those inherently existent afflictions is emptiness. And that is considered an ultimate truth. So His Holiness, what he's saying here is he thinks, yes, nirvana is an emptiness. The absence of afflictions, that is nirvana, a true cessation, is a non-affirming negative. The afflictions can never again arise because their causes have been completely eradicated. If nirvana were an affirming negative, a having ceased of the afflictions, rather than their total extinguishment, then the afflictions could arise once again. Okay, so remember we talked about uh, having ceased before, and it's going to come again in Volume 9, but this is only Volume 3, so there's a ways to go. Okay. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, the having happened, it's another way, or the having ceased of things is an affirming negation. Yeah, you're affirming 
that of an event existed or an ex- a, a, a phenomena existed and it ceased. Okay? So you're affirming the, it's a non-affirming, no, it's an affirming negation. You're affirming that phenomena and uh, you're, and then you're saying that it has ceased. In other words, you're negating its present existence. Okay. And you might say, well, but, you know, okay, the, the movie happened and then it ceased. You're still left without a movie. Why isn't that just the absence of the movie? Why isn't that emptiness? Well, because the former existence of that object and its having ceased at some point has an effect. It's not that things arise and cease and they don't have an effect. So having ceased, or, you know, you can call it a having happened, okay, like, uh, you know, the, uh, the fire last summers, the, la- the fires last summer, they existed and they ceased, but because they existed and they ceased, that has a result, doesn't it, you know? The result is that, well, there's many results. We try and prevent forest fires. There's a whole swath of, uh, swath of land that is where the trees are burned. So there's many results that came from it. So we can't just say, well, the fire was put out. It doesn't make any difference now that it's out. No, it, it existed, and so it ceased, and all of that has an effect. Yeah. But when you negate inherent existence, yeah, inherent existence never existed. So when you negate it, it's a non-affirming negative. Okay? And that emptiness has always been there. The, you know, the emptiness of, of the thermos um, or the mind, let's stick with the mind. The emptiness of the, the polluted mind with afflictions and the emptiness of that purified mind, in one way, they're exactly the same. They're the absence of inherent existence of the mind. In another way, they're different because one is the emptiness of a, a mind a mind that's afflicted, and the other is the emptiness of a mind that's not afflicted. Okay. Mm. So the, uh, yeah, so when you have a true cessation, the afflictions can never again arise because their causes have been completely eradicated. If nirvana were an affirming negative, a having ceased of the afflictions, rather than their total extinguishment, then the afflictions could rise again. This is because the having ceased of impermanent phenomena, such as afflictions, can produce a a result. However, in nirvana, the afflictions and their causes can never again appear. So if they can never appear, they can never cause any kind of result, and so that person is liberated from samsara. So that's why the nirvana is the emptiness of the mind that is the mind that is totally purified of afflictions. Nothing else is being affirmed. So nirvana is also the state beyond sorrow. Sorrow here refers to samsara the dukkha of samsara, and also the origin or the causes of samsara. Alternatively, sorrow sorrow, uh, can allude to inherent existence, and nirvana being beyond sorrow indicates that it is the emptiness of inherent existence. So we're used to hearing of nirvana as being the state beyond 
you know, it's beyond sorrow, and we usually think of sorrow of an, as inherent existence. But that's not the only way to look at that term, okay? Sorrow can indicate inherent existence, so then nirvana is the emptiness of that inherent existence. Okay, so four types of nirvana are spoken of. Natural nirvana, nirvana with remainder, nirvana without remainder, and non-abiding nirvana. Okay, so let's pause here. Yes. A question about the um, previous page where it says all produced things naturally cease mm -hmm. because momentary disintegration is part of their nature. So like samsara is a produced thing, but yeah. it is not ceased um, naturally. Yeah, one moment of samsara ceases, but another one arises. So samsara is impermanent, it ceases, but it gives rise to something that is the same thing, in, or not exactly the same, but it's in that same continuum. So this is talking about momentary cessation, Yeah, not about the cessation of the phenomena or the thing. It's not talking about the cessation of the afflictions. No, it's not talking about the cessation of things. Okay, there, there's two kinds of, we could call cessation. There's one moment ceases, the next moment arises, then the third moment arises, and the fourth moment. And for each consecutive moment to arise, the previous mind has to cease, okay? So that's called subtle impermanence. Gross impermanence is... The house exists, and then it falls down. Okay, so you had the house, and then you don't have the house. So that's the kind of impermanence that we can see with our eyes and so forth. You can't have the gross impermanence without those everything having the subtle impermanence of uh, changing moment by moment. And His Holiness here always gives the example of um, the sun rising, okay? And the, the, the sun arises, and then it's a long time in the sky, and then it sets, okay? And he says, you know, we only really notice it when it arises and when it sets. That's like the the uh, gross impermanence that, that we can see, yeah. But the sun can't get from here to here unless moment by moment it was moving, yeah. So everything has the momentary uh, cessation, but for, uh, and the building has the gross cessation, it falls down, our mind does not have the gross cessation because there's no antidote that can uh, sever the continuity of consciousness. Okay? So this statement refers to subtle impermanence. It's Which statement? The all produced things naturally cease. It's yeah. Talking about, it's not the talking subtle about impermanence. All in, yeah. All cessation. Yeah, that all those things are subtly changing. Yeah, moment by moment. And you, you know, you, you see this come up, you know, when they talk about things, the first moment of this and the second moment of this. And the two moments to us very gross beings look exactly the same, but they aren't the same. One is the first moment, one is the second moment. Second moment is the result of the first moment. So they're different, yeah. even though uh, superficially to our senses they look the same, but our senses are quite gross. Yeah. When you have uh, a yogic direct perceiver of subtle impermanence, then you can see the, that momentary change, which must be quite uh, Amazing if you think about, you know, being able to look at everything and seeing it arising and ceasing all the time. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Um, nirvana is a state of the mind or a quality of the mind. Samsara is actually our five aggregates, our body and the four mental aggregates. We often talk about samsara as if it's the world, like the external world. It's not. It's our five polluted aggregates. Okay. Otherwise, stopping samsara would mean destroying this whole, you know, planet and everything else in the universe, which is not what happens when somebody attains nirvana. <laughs> okay. Uh huh. Just want to check with you if I'm understanding correctly. Mm -hmm. If nirvana is the state beyond sorrow, mm -hmm. uh, sorrow referring to samsara, it means that we are when all the afflictions are seized in our mind, mm -hmm. we do not produce karma anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're out of the cyclic existence. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're out of samsara. Yeah. Is it like that? Uh, similar. We can still produce unpolluted karma. Yeah. But we don't produce anymore the karma that causes rebirth. And, uh, the d different traditions have different assertions for, or should I say they have, they speak of it differently for different levels of practitioners. Our hearts may still have the seeds of uh, even negative karmas and certainly polluted karma on their mind stream. But because craving and clinging have been discontinued, because ignorance has been discontinued, then those karmic seeds can no longer ripen. Yeah. For a Buddha, yeah, any kind of polluted anything in the mind has been abandoned or tra you know it transforms into something unpolluted you had some going back to the two objects of negation mm -hmm. they uh, i don't know my mind wants to go like in two different directions like oh you have to meditate on two different kinds of wisdom to negate them but they're negated simultaneously through mm -hmm. the same practices yeah. Right. Yeah. Because when you negate inherent existence, the energy of the grasping at inherent existence is also takes a hit. I'm trying to figure out how um, applying antidotes to afflictions um, helps to support our realizing emptiness. Okay. So... The ultimate antidote is the wisdom realizing emptiness. But that's going to take us a while to generate. So in the meantime, we need more immediate afflict, uh, antidotes so that we don't continue to create so much negative karma that keeps throwing us into lower realms. So that's why... You know, when Shanti Deva gives all those antidotes to anger and to jealousy, that's what he's helping us to do. Okay, because we we need that continuity of good rebirths in order to attain liberation and awakening. So it's kind of like uh, you you need hip surgery. But before it, you, you take ibuprofen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Anything else? Can you explain a little bit about that, um, you know, the wisdom realizing emptiness is the one that's uh, eradicating the afflictive obscuration and it also eradicates the cognitive obscuration is the same <coughs> emptiness um, and yet it's doing this two different jobs. Yeah. How does that work? Okay. Ajax can clean a sink and it can clean a toilet. 
okay? And Ajax can take away the, the big, um, uh, the big dirt in your sink. But after you take that away, there's still like some residue. Then you put more Ajax on it, it takes that away. So that's how emptiness, you know, it, you have to familiarize the mind with emptiness and use it and use that wisdom. It's not the emptiness that eliminates the afflictions. It's the wisdom realizing the emptiness that does. So when you're removing the gross things, you have renunciation, you can reduce, uh, remove the gross stuff. And then if you have bodhicitta, then it can really go and get all the stains out. Well, no, the only thing that actually takes the dirt and the stains that are involved as with the cause of samsara and that obscure the mind, the only thing that does that is the wisdom realizing emptiness. Renunciation and bodhicitta are things that are preliminary states of mind. Well, renunciation definitely, you know, without renunciation, we have no interest in realizing emptiness. Yeah. What bodhicitta does is it gives more oomph to the uh, to the wisdom realizing emptiness, yeah. Uh, and when you realize when you start cleansing the mind, you have to do it in layers. It's like peeling an onion, yeah. So you have to do it in layers. You can't just do it all at once. So when you realize a certain layers, you know, then you've, you're at our hardship. And then the bodhicitta, you know, especially uh, because of the great accumulation that that we, uh, you know, collect uh, by, you know, the method side of the path, act, virtuous actions done with bodhicitta, then that supports the mind and gives the mind, you know, gives the support to the emptiness so that it can remove also the cognitive obscurations. Uh-huh. Um, so when we say nirvana is a non-affirming negative, are we saying that because um, the wisdom realizing emptiness doesn't affirm conventionalities, but a, a valid cognizer would affirm conventionalities? Mm, it's not talking here specifically about in the realization of emptiness, there's no appearance of conventionalities. That's that's not the discussion here. Yeah, it's that, uh, you know, the afflictions depend on the grasping of inherent existence, which perceives things in one way. The wisdom comes along and says, bam, you know, you're perceiving things in the wrong way. That wisdom goes then the afflictions can't stand either. Okay. But when they talk about what is a, a direct perceiver of emptiness, that's when you come up, well, it's non-dual. What is non-dual mind? It's free from elaborations. What does that mean? Well, one meaning is there's no appearance of conventional phenomena. Yeah. And so the only way to assert conventionalities is through a different mind. Yes. Not yes. the same mind. Yeah, the wisdom realizing emptiness does not certify um, conventional phenomena. And in fact, it doesn't even certify its own existence. The Arya has to come out of the meditative equipoise on emptiness. And then they go, oh, I realized emptiness. And so that certifies the existence of emptiness. So emptiness and the existence of emptiness are different. Okay. And emptiness is a, is a non-affirming attitude, but the wisdom realizing emptiness is a non-affirming attitude. Yeah. You can't hear me. Oh, she said, I'll say it again. <laughs> that the... Um, Wisdom realizing emptiness is an impermanent phenomena, 
but the emptiness itself is a permanent phenomenon and a right. non-affirming and negative. Right. Yeah. So the wisdom, you know, wisdom is a consciousness. Any consciousness is changing moment by moment. It doesn't re- remain the same. Yeah. So a impermanent consciousness, yeah, can realize a permanent phenomena. Yeah. So here permanent, the, maybe this part of the thing that needs to be clarified. In regular English, we usually think of permanent as meaning eternal, it lasts forever. And we think of impermanent as meaning it stops after a while and it has no continuity. In Buddhism, that's not the meaning of permanent and impermanent. Yeah, here impermanent just means on a momentary level it's changing. Yeah, but an impermanent thing doesn't isn't necessarily eternal. Yeah, the fire, uh, you know, that we we burn the 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 slash with, is impermanent. You know, it ceases. It has gross cessation and subtle change too. Okay, so uh, so in Buddhism, permanent means that it is not produced, it doesn't arise due to causes and conditions. Yeah, some permanent phenomena are eternal, some permanent phenomena are not eternal. So it's using the words permanent and impermanent a bit differently than in our regular language. Mm-hmm. If every emptiness needs to have an object that it's an emptiness of, uh-huh. every moment of mind doesn't have a new moment of emptiness, or does it? It does. Every moment of mind has a new moment of emptiness, but it's there's, still a per- that's still a permanent phenomenon. Yes. There's the emptiness of the first moment of mind, the emptiness of the second moment of mind. Because you know, so we use those different terms because the mind has changed. And so in that way, we say that there are different moments of emptiness. But both of them are the emptiness of inherent existence, and that doesn't change. (laughs) Okay, let's dedicate. So this requires some thought. Yeah? (laughs) Okay, what uh, what page are we on? We did two pages, yippee.